Today marks the 63rd anniversary of Ajahn Lee's passing. He was my teacher's teacher. And in getting to know Ajahn Fung, I also got to know Ajahn Lee through Ajahn Fung's eyes. And of course, through the books that Ajahn Lee left behind. And one theme that came out very strongly, both in what Ajahn Fung had to say about him, and what I had learned to read in Ajahn Lee's books, was that he approached the practice as a skill. I think more than any of the Forest of John's or any other contemporary teacher. That was his main focus. The Buddha, of course, would use images of people with skills to describe how you should practice. Like being an archer, the Buddha would say, you learn how to fire shots in rapid succession, shoot long distances and pierce great masses. Firing shots in rapid succession meant seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, identifying very quickly what you're doing that's suffering, what you're doing that's causing the suffering, and what you could do to put an end to that cause. Shooting long distances is seeing the implications of teachings. You look at your aggregates in the present moment. Form is in constant feelings, perceptions, thought constructs, consciousness. They're all in constant. Because they're in constant, they're stressful. Because they're in constant and stressful, they're not really worth claiming as you or yours. You see this in the present moment, and then you reflect. Back in the past, did you ever have a permanent form or permanent feeling? No. How about the future? Oftentimes the mind will think about how it doesn't like being where it is right now, but if you could change things a little bit, things would get a lot better. But no matter how much better you can make the aggregates, you can never change them from their inconstancy, their stress, and the fact that they're not self. When you think in those ways, you get a more global sense of dispassion. Even Sangwega. Of course, piercing great masses is piercing the mass of ignorance that underlies your fascination with making a new you, making a new world out of the aggregates. Something we do all the time. We're ignorant of the suffering involved, the stress involved. We either feel that we, we sense it to some extent, but we feel, oh, it doesn't matter because this is all we've got, so we might as well make the best of what we've got. But the Buddha says there's something better. That's one of the ways in which the Buddha would use the skills of archers, cooks, other craftsmen, to draw analogies for the path and the practice. And John Lee would take the analogies of you know, skills, used in another way, to talk about what is, is involved in actually mastering a skill. You learn from the teacher the basic steps. But if you're going to, say, become a really good basket weaver, or get really good at making clay tiles, you don't learn just from the teacher, you learn from your own actions and from the object you're acting on. You commit yourself to trying it out, making clay tiles and firing them, and see how they come out. Or you weave a basket and see how it comes out. And you see, okay, there's, the basket is lopsided or it's poorly proportioned, the clay tiles are brittle. What could you do to change? This means that you have to be alert to what you're doing while you're doing it, and also learn to be sensitive to the object you're working on, because you're going to be taking that, as he said, as your teacher too. All this, of course, applies to the breath. You've got to be sensitive to the breathing. Commit yourself to staying there, and then ask yourself, how can we make this comfortable? So you try it out. And if it's not comfortable, then you ask yourself, what can you do to change?
then you try that out. And you don't give up. This is an important part of the practice. Don't let yourself get defeated by the fact that you can't master it quickly. Our educational system plays a huge emphasis on trying to figure out what you're already talented in, what your natural talents are, and then directing you in that direction. They're very poor at teaching you how to master a skill that you may not be originally good at. But here John Lee sets out all the steps, and one of which is your persistence. You stick with it, and then you reflect. What you've got there are what are called the four bases for success. You want to do it, then you keep yourself motivated, and then you're persistent. Persistence basically means continuing to motivate yourself. All too often we see effort in the practice as being a burden or a chore, when it doesn't have to be. Reflect on the fact that you're sitting here. Nobody is making demands on you right now. You don't have a house full of children screaming that they're hungry. You've got the time. You're free of outside obligations right now, so you can focus on your own mind on your own breath, and then work at making them compatible. So you keep reminding yourself that this is a good thing to do. And then you start trying to notice when you're doing it well and when you're not doing it well, and when you're not doing it well, figuring out what you can do to make it better. This brings in two other qualities. One is intentness, which means you give this your full attention. The breath is something you've been aware of for a long time, but have you ever been fully aware of the breath? What are these breath energies in the body? And John Lee talks about many different levels. There's the in and out breath, and then there are the subtle sens sensations of movement in the blood vessels and the nerves. And then there's the still breath, which is related often to points that we otherwise known as the chakras, the breath can be very still. You focus there and you can think of that stillness spreading throughout, permeating throughout the whole body. So you've got lots of different levels you can focus on. And then John Lee himself provides many different ways of analyzing breath energies. The breath energies that spin in place, the ones that move in and out, the ones that go from one part of the body to another, all kinds of breath energies. Once they move, what direction should they move right now? You can play. This is one aspect of John Lee's teachings that it's really endearing, his, his sense of humor, his sense of play. You heard it in the Dharma talk last night. Where he got that story, I have no idea. And John Fung said that they used to have these all-night sits, and on the hour they would have a different monk get up and give a Dharma talk. And he could talk for just a few minutes, he could talk for a whole hour, it's up to him. And John Lee would always keep the 3 a.m. shift for himself, the point where everybody's really sleeping. And he would tell stories like that, keep everybody awake. And that quality applies to the fourth of the basis for success, once you've got the desire and the persistence and the intent, is you use your powers of analysis. And that includes using your ingenuity. When something doesn't work, what could work? Use your imagination. I know there are a lot of Meditation methods to say, well, you just know whatever is there and don't get involved in imaginings and don't get involved in thought worlds. And to some extent, it's right. But if you're approaching meditation as a skill, you've got to have some ingenuity to figure out when something is not working, how you could make it work. 
You know, like the little child that when the toy breaks, you just go running to mommy and daddy and say, it's broken, get me a new one. That's certainly not the attitude of anybody in the forest tradition, any of the teachers. You're out in the forest, say you're a student of John Mun, he's giving you some pointers on how to practice, and then you go off on your own, and things are going to come up, and you've got to deal with them. You can't go running to John Mun all the time. So you learn to rely on yourself, your own powers of observation, your own ingenuity. Or what John Lee would sometimes say when he would translate that fourth basis for success, say, so use your circumspection, look around. Try to figure out good analogies for what you're doing and ask yourself, am I applying the wrong analogy? Is there a better one to apply? Sometimes we think of breathing as like a bellows. You force the air in and out a little tiny hole. There's a lot of pressure involved. Well, think of there being no pressure at all in the breathing. The breath can still come in, still go out, but you don't have to push it, you don't have to suck it in. Think of breath, breathing breath. Come up with a new image and see what that does. And John Lee talks about breath energy coming in the back of the neck, for example. What can you do with that idea? It helps to counteract the tendency we sometimes have of pulling the breath in, sort of pulling on our facial muscles. And tension will build up in the back of the head and back of the neck. Well, think of the breath coming in the other direction. Or any point in the body where there's a pain. Think of the breath entering the body right at that point, spreading from that point. See what that does. There's lots to play with. And in the playing, you learn. I know an author who basically said scientists are like adults who get to still play around, like little kids do. Try this experiment, try that experiment. Well, a good meditator is like that, too. You learn how to play around in a way that actually leads to knowledge, because you're looking in terms of cause and effect. And that's what this sermon is all about. You want to see what's causing suffering in your mind? Well, you change your mind. Change your ways of thinking. See what that does. And change them again if it's not working. It's in this way that meditation becomes a skill. You commit yourself to it, and then you reflect on what you're doing. Learn from your actions. Learn from the breath. And that way the meditation becomes your own. It's like learning a language. You can either go to a class where they explain all the grammar and everything to you, or you can go to the country where they speak that language. And notice on your own, oh, when they say this, is, this is what it means. When they say that, that's what it means. It's the second method where it really becomes your own. Because you've used your own powers of observation. Insight is not simply a matter of memorizing the Buddha's insights, copying them and pasting them on your own mind. The insights come from your own observation of what works and what doesn't work and reducing the amount of suffering that you're creating. And when you observe something for yourself, you're a lot more likely to remember it, and the lesson goes a lot deeper.